welcome to another edition of Resistance TV. The treatment of Julian Assange is nothing short of an international outrage, and the role of the corporate media has been absolutely scandalous. The UK and US governments are engaged in what can only be described as a criminal conspiracy to punish Julian Assange for exposing the abuse of political, corporate and state power, up to and including sickening war crimes. They're determined, it seems to me, to silence the world's most important truth teller. And if the US succeed in extraditing Julian, he faces the prospect of a 175 year jail sentence. So I'm delighted to welcome Kim Stanton onto the show this evening, who's the director of a new film about Julian's plight called The Trust Fall, Julian Assange. And Kim is joining us from Sydney in Australia. Hi, Kim. Welcome to the show. How are you? Very well, Chris. Thanks for having me. Well, oh, great. We're really, really delighted that you've taken the time out to to join us because this is uh, such an important documentary that you've made but just before we get into our discussion uh, Kim I, I thought that uh, we might just play a clip of the reactions of uh, people who attended the world premiere of your document of your documentary which I, I understand was, was shown in Australia which is obviously Julian's um, country of, of birth isn't it so we'll just play that first and then we'll get into the discussion such a moving film and I would implore everybody to watch it. First class. I would be very proud to have made a film like that. I um, just got angrier and angrier as the film went on and I'm going to go home and warn my children that their lives are f***. Yeah, it was wonderfully produced, wonderfully written with a lot of empathy and a lot of truth and giving us all inspiration to stand up to the powers of the people. I feel like I've, I've got a lot of knowledge about it now, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was fantastic. Amazing movie. And hopefully this is going to bring everything to light and, and you know, let's bring a brother home. You know, let's get him home. It's been too long. I hadn't heard of John Pilcher for a long time and he was in there uh, with a very cogent views and all the other commentators were absolutely superb. It was really eye-opening and I really recommend watching this film to get insight into um, just so much deception and to learn about how you can make a difference. Brilliant film, very emotional. I had to go and um, get a wine because I had quite a few tears. It was very, very hard to watch, but very important to watch. So. It's really powerful. I think Kim's done a fantastic job. Watching it was very upsetting it was. and intense, major, but it, major it, angry, will, it will open people's eyes. So oh, yeah, another valuable film. Yeah, yeah, yes. no, no. recommend it. Just hope many people see it because it could make a really powerful impact. Well, clearly those people were very impressed by uh, what they saw. I think it seems uh, from their reactions, it, it had a real uh, impact on them. So I wonder maybe, Kim, if you could just perhaps start by, by telling us how you came to make this film in the first place. Sure. Uh, well, like a lot of people, I had loosely followed the story since that uh, powerful video, Collateral Murder, that was um, that went viral basically in 2010. At the time, I, I saw that footage and it, it shocked me. Um, I didn't know what WikiLeaks was or who Julian Assange was. I never took the time to really go deeply into it. But over the years... I gradually watched various documentaries and started to put the pieces together. Um, I've been involved in the documentary industry for nearly 10 years now, uh, basically as a, as a hybrid distributor, uh, putting on screenings of documentaries, including in the United Kingdom, um, through my enterprise Films for Change. And then... Uh, it's yeah it's always been uh, something i've thought of doing was to to actually get behind the camera and make a documentary uh wasn't sure what topic i would do and um i guess it was um through watching various documentaries that i i started to really understand the importance of this story and uh and then in uh 2021 may 2021 I decided, well, it's a good time now to make a, a, a documentary, but it was going to be just a, a, a simple YouTube sort of film. It might take a few months to do. And um, I actually filmed the first interview with Julian's father, John Shipton, on my mobile phone, on a tripod. Um, 
but then the project just rapidly expanded and we had incredible support from the public from this uh, amazing worldwide supporter network uh, to enable us to to actually turn it into a cinema ready piece um, to expand the budget and expand the scope and instead of interviewing just a few people we ended up interviewing uh, 23 of the the most prominent voices on the topic um, and it just grew and grew and um, and now here here we are two and a half years later with a film that's uh, coming out in in festivals yeah no well it's it's fantastic and great uh, testament to your uh your commitment really to to you know bring this film to to the screen but i wonder whether you might just sort of say what kind of obstacles if any that you encountered in making the film well the first obstacle was i had no idea what i was doing um <laughs> apart from a bit of an idea of sort of um that uh, a bit of an idea of sort of narrative and 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 topics and structure um uh, but yeah, the, the rest I just sort of picked up as I went along. And so there was enormous challenges. Um, um, the first challenge was how to reach these uh, interesting people to to interview them, how to get in touch, being not being someone that's um, well known or an author or any of that, not, not having um, very many connections. So um, managed to sort of find a way to to reach all the people that we wanted to interview. and. Other than that, um, hiring videographers, uh, not not attempting to do the video work myself, um, putting that into the hands of experts and uh, getting a lot of advice uh, from people along the way, from other filmmakers to solve all kinds of issues. And uh, yeah, and just and also just getting the right people involved into the team to um, to sort of fill in the gaps of, of areas that I hadn't had no idea of, of, of what I was doing. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got some very impressive uh, contributors uh, to the uh, uh, documentary. I mean, uh, I mean, you said that you'd had no idea how to to reach them. I mean, did you? I mean, when you got in touch with people like John Pilge, I mean, were they kind of very willing and happy to, or did it take some persuading to get some of the uh, people to participate? Yeah, look, we really spoiled for choice with the caliber of the the interviewees in the film and 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 in this campaign and the uh, people's ability, ability to articulate ideas and and their their brilliance and their intelligence is um, I don't think we're matched by any other campaign that's going on in the world right now to have people like the the recent Daniel Ellsberg who who sadly passed away um, not a, not yeah. long ago um, yeah. the legendary film uh, Australian filmmaker uh, John Pilger and then uh, Authors like Tariq Ali, human rights lawyer Jennifer Robinson, ex-presidential candidate uh, Jill Stein from Doctors for Assange, and so on. Um, amazing people to to talk to and and connect with, and uh, and most of them were very willing to be involved because they're so passionate about this cause, and mm. it's uh, it's a network. They they all know each other pretty much, and. Um, yeah, pretty pretty willing to get involved, especially once they got a sense of what I was aiming to do, and uh, and I shared the sort of the the plot line synopsis um, or the treatment, I should say, to use the right term. Um, yeah, it did for for some of them. It took it took a little bit of persistence and patience, um, and eventually we we did basically interview. 99% of the people that we wanted to there's a few wow. people I would have liked to reach but wasn't able to um but yeah, yeah very happy with the result of of the, the the luminaries and the the uh thinkers and speakers that we've um, been able to include in the film oh, fantastic I wonder uh, as well whether you might sort of give your thoughts on the way in which the corporate media have covered Julian's case I, I mean obviously I don't know the detail in Australia, but certainly here in the UK, the corporate media, it's been a combination really of silence um, and denigration, to be honest with you, of, of Julia, predominantly anyway. Um, and uh, so consequently, you know, not as many people are as aware of uh, his appalling treatment and the importance of Julian Assange as, uh, you know, as perhaps they, they ought to be. And 
clearly we're doing our best through social media and things like that. And, and there is a lot of support, obviously, for Julian. But it should be so much more. I wonder what, I mean, what's it like in Australia? What, what's your general take on how the corporate media have, have dealt with this case? Well, I think the corporate media in largely has been absent, um, basically a blackout on this topic from most of them for, for years at a time. Um, they'll, they'll come back and, and cover the story whenever things get worse because that sort of plays into what they presume they're supposed to be doing, the angle that they think they're supposed to have. Um, according to you know what they're told to do and this sort of presumption that that they're supposed to be siding against this rebellious um, innovator, this uh, this dissident. Um, so uh, and you've got to you got to think about the context of that. Um, so you know at the height of the influence of WikiLeaks in, around 2010, 2011, um, we were seeing that, um, Many of the major, the biggest media outlets in the world, like the New York Times, the Guardian, De Spiegel, Le Monde, were benefiting from these amazing disclosures, these these powerful bits of information that that WikiLeaks was uncovering. Um, and then, as soon as he his character was smeared through these various allegations and defamation and and all of these false narrative. Uh, then they just flipped around. They, they threw him under the bus and went against him, turned against him, um, which is to the detriment of their own profession. They're undermining the integrity of their own industry by doing that. And I think in the last 12 months, we've seen a little bit of a turnaround. Finally, those big newspapers that, that collaborated with Julian and WikiLeaks at the height of their um, influence are finally speaking out. Um, you've seen a huge turnaround from The Guardian, who were the source of many of the biggest smears uh, up until very recently. And then they've finally started to put out sort of a series of um, regular, um, somewhat supportive uh, articles. So they're, they're coming to their senses um, better late than never. Um, but it should have been it should have been massive. I mean, right from the beginning, they should have been on his side. Uh, they should have been intelligent enough to um, to support him, um, but they weren't. And I think the ironic thing about it is that here we are in 2023 and with the rapid uh, advancement of AI technology, these sort of hack journalists, uh, so-called journalists, corporate journalists that just print government handouts and just regurgitate um, whatever their, their peers are, are covering, and whatever the governments want them to say, to say um, they're basically in the process of being replaced by AI, yeah. uh, which is kind of ironic. Um, whereas uh, the the type of journalism that Julian Assange um, created is, um, and and you know, there's this strange challenge or, or, or uh, criticism of Julian is that he's not a real journalist. However. Uh, in my opinion, he revolutionised journalism. It's it's basically like a neo uh, journalism um, that they can't compete with, and uh, and so that kind of journalism could never be replaced by AI. This journalism where you have um, 100% accurate information coming straight from the source, uh, unfiltered, and um, straight to the public uh, to reveal crimes. I mean, there's never going to be an AI that can do that. So, um, so their their careers are are at risk, um, and uh, what they should be doing in order to save their their own industry is is number one, um, defend someone like Julian Assange, and any kind of whistleblower or publisher of of true information, and uh, number two, um, do some authentic real journalism that, that actually involves some cohesive thought and some useful information. Yes, indeed. I mean, and the 100% accuracy of, of WikiLeaks uh, revelations is something that uh, the corporate media come nowhere near to achieving, as we know. And uh, I mean, regularly put out 
you know, a very, very uh, partial um, stories as, uh, and portray them as news when, in, you know, in reality, you know, they're, they're putting forward a, a, a very partial uh, viewpoint. Um, but what about the uh, the political class as well? I mean, in terms of their response, I mean, I've been quite critical of uh, the, uh, the lack of support, the lack of outrage, frankly, from from uh, elected politicians, certainly uh, in, in this country. I, I think, um, we, from what I'm seeing anyway, there, there are some politicians who are really pushing for Julian's uh, case now in Australia. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but, but perhaps you could just uh, tell us what your thoughts are really about how the politicians around the world have responded to to Julian, and uh, and what um, you know, are there any really good sort of political champions who are who are pushing the, the you know the United States to, to to drop these ridiculous charges against him? Yeah, look, it's a it's a great topic to talk about because what people don't realize straight away because of the way that this issue is presented as a as a supposedly a legal case what people don't realize is that it's actually a political issue um this uh it's about um our access to information it's about free speech it's about uh one powerful government the most powerful empire on the uh, that's ever existed the u.s government um using extraterritorial overreach to attempt to pluck an australian citizen from another from the uk and take it take them back to their own country um so it's a very it's it's completely political uh all the legal stuff is is um really um based on a on lies and and fabrications um and and false narratives uh so when when we realize that it's political then it's very interesting to look at the response from various governments especially the australian government considering that assange is an australian citizen and so up until a couple of years ago when anthony albanese with the current labor government in australia uh, for the first time showed some sort of vague sense of support for julian then you've seen a shift definitely a shift has occurred um every government prior to that for this whole time of his persecution and we're talking 12 and a half years um, beginning with the the gillard government we've just seen the various australian prime ministers and governments um, doing the bidding of their u.s counterparts and um and accusing julian of all kinds of of, of all kinds of ridiculous notions um uh, basically um uh, characterizing him as 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 a criminal um so there's a big shift being that anthony albanese came out with this line enough is enough um which is a bit of a you know the aussie politicians love to use these kind of slang terms so they sound more down to earth um enough is enough is a a clever one because it it's sort of for for a supporter an optimistic supporter of of assange it would sound like well that's enough let's finish this let's let's set him free however um it, it only took about a year i mean i mean it was it took a long a long time a year for albanese to sort of clarify and say well what i meant by enough is enough is that uh this should be brought to a close he's never said that julian should be free mm. um so there's a in, really important distinction between um, what we'd like him to be saying and what he's uh, actually saying. Um, and uh, and so for about a year, he strung everyone along with this sort of weasel words uh, along a merry dance that um, the that this uh, sort of uh, hope that he was doing something. And what we've seen uh, in the last six months through various freedom of information requests, um, by politicians and journalists in Australia is that there's no documents at all between uh, for the last six months or maybe nine months now, there's been no documents between uh, diplomatic documents between Australian and the US government on Assange. Nothing comes up. Uh, so then they've claimed that they're doing this quiet diplomacy behind closed doors, um, you know, just conversational diplomacy, which is very unusual for diplomats. They, they love paperwork. So uh, it's pretty much been revealed that um, a, a couple of months ago, it became pretty apparent that they weren't doing anything. It was all just 
a facade. And then uh, just recently, last few weeks, we've had uh, Anthony Blinken, the, uh, I can't remember his role in the US government. Um, he visited Australia. I think he's Sec Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Uh, yeah. He so of he's, State. Basically, he's basically uh, continuing this line that, that Julian's done some serious crimes, although, you know, he's the messenger. In, in fact, he's, he's not the criminal. He was exposing the actions of criminals. Um, but that's what that's what Blinken said, and then you had, uh, and then you had Caroline Kennedy, the U.S. ambassador, um, saying that a plea deal might be possible. Um, which, again, there's there's no evidence of that. There's no um, um, there's no reason for us to believe um, that that's even on the table. Um, so that's a whole one, another yeah, mm -hmm. complex topic to get into as well. But um, yeah, basically the the, but I, I guess there's a little bit of a glimmer of hope in in amongst Australian politics, not from the 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 um, the prime minister, the current prime minister Albanese, but from the other independents, Greens, um, mainly from these other parties. Um, so people like David Shoebridge, um, Peter Wish Wilson from the Greens party, um, coming out and speaking up for Julian in Parliament in the Senate. Um, there was a Senate debate a few weeks ago where you had some really powerful speeches, including um, one from Peter Wish Wilson from the Greens. And uh, and then we've seen uh, this news that uh, this month, later this month, there'll be a delegation of Australian MPs going to the US to present a letter to talk to um, senators in America um, about this issue and and demanding Julian's freedom and asking them to consider what's at stake here and, and what's the right thing to do. Um, and the letter was signed by 63 parliamentarians um, yeah. in Australia. And, uh, and, and you know, that's, that's significant. And that number has grown. I, it's, it's probably basically doubled yeah. over the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's a, something worth noting. And yes. considering 150 one members of the House of Representatives in, in Australia. So, so we're verging on sort of half of those MPs yeah. agreeing that yeah. Julian should be freed, that the, the US should drop this extradition. Um, so it's the support is growing, yeah. and so I mean, it should be, but it's it's just happened so slowly. I mean, the, the, for this to go on for uh, year, I mean, for, for for him to be in the Ecuadorian embassy for almost seven years, and then more than four years in. Belmarsh Prison. So, you know, we're talking about uh, coming up to 12 years of, of persecution. I mean, it even started before that with the house arrest. Uh, for, for them to take over a decade and then to have Anthony Blinken sort of continuing this, this false narrative of that, that Julian's committed crimes um, yeah. just by publishing information. I mean, it's, it, it just it just beggars belief. I mean, it, but uh, but you know why does this continue? Because of the ignorance of the masses. Um, because indeed, I mean, and you know, Nils Melzer um, made this point himself in his um, seminal book, uh, the Trial of Julian Assange. Uh, Nils Melzer, being the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on torture, he's said in terms that Julian is being is being tortured uh, in Belmar's prison when he was being held in, in solitary uh, confinement. But in his book, he, he says that he himself was duped uh, and thought that, you know, Julian, you know, was an unworthy uh, individual because Julian had approached him for, for support. And initially, uh, you know, he dismiss, dismissed it. I mean, uh, as well as watching your crucially important documentary, uh, uh, Kim, I would also recommend if people haven't read uh, Nils, Melz, Nils Melzer's Book as well, but just wanted to get your thoughts as well uh, as we're moving towards the, the close on um, on the extradition treaty between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, because it's very clear uh, that anybody who is uh, alleged crime, as it were, is is, is a political one. Uh, then the the terms of the treaty don't apply. You know, extradition will not be forthcoming in those circumstances. And as I've said on public platforms on a number of occasions, what could be more political than exposing war crimes? I mean, this sort of goes right to the heart, doesn't it, of, of, of the essentially the kind of the corruption, the corrupt, uh, the corruption of our of our judicial system, doesn't it? Indeed. Yeah. Um, 
Niels Mauser's work was so important in all of this. Um, his book, The Trial of Julian Assange, uh, incredibly researched, incredibly articulate, fantastic book. Really recommend it. Um, yeah. I don't get any uh, any royalties on on sales, <laughs> um, but you know, and but I, when I speak to Niels, he says please mention my book. And, and I said, look, you don't even have to ask because it's so well done. I just, I end up mentioning it. Um, and we were really happy to ha involve him in the film because um, he just, he just explains so well this process that he went through, which was um, he basically says in the interview, which we include in the film is that he had all these prejudices against Assange, but he didn't know where he got them from, where they came from. So that just speaks to this, ability of television and mass media to sort of you know find its way flow into our subconscious and and sort of we we gradually form an opinion about something we know so little about and so he had a turnaround the, the julian's lawyers reached out to him and uh prior to 2019 and said look we really need your help you're the un special rapporteur on torture we think julian is a victim of torture he ignored the emails and then, or, or you know, de declined to be involved, and and then eventually realised uh, when they presented some evidence to him that he couldn't deny. He went, well, I'll look into this, and he discovered that uh, the more the deeper he looked, the more dirt came out, and it wasn't it wasn't Julian Assange's dirt; it was the the government's dirt. Um, so a compelling book, and uh, we just touch on some of those uh, key sort of points that he exposes we cover we cover them in the film um but uh, back to the question about the extradition treaty well that's just one of one example of i guess dozens of ways that the the us and uk and and sweden australian governments have and ecuadorian governments have uh just trampled over the human rights laws all of these declarations, all of these artifacts that are supposed to allow us to live in a democratic and lawful and uh, just society. Uh, this whole issue, this whole situation is a Pandora's box of, of transgressions and arbitrariness, um, which just made, um, you know, as, as I explored into it to, to create the film, as I uh, researched and uncovered things I, I i had to narrow down i couldn't even cover everything you know that that issue of the treaty we just quickly mention it we have jennifer robinson human rights lawyer briefly brushing over that we don't get to go into much detail because there's so many other things that are even worse uh in a way like for example the 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 plot of the cia to actually assassinate julian in london to to draw up yes. they even go as far as drawing up sketches on how they could do it and and yeah. for you know this idea that it's okay to extradite someone to a country that that's plotting to kill them um and then this uh evidence that's been uncovered um not long ago about their star witness Sigurd Sigurd Arsen from yes. Iceland the number one witness um lied in his testimony uh, and was was bought out um, by the by the CIA or the FBI, um, just basically bribed or blackmailed to to say things to to claim things that weren't true, um, and it just goes on and on. And and one of yeah. the I mean he's he's admitted that as well, I believe, hasn't he? Uh, yeah. I mean you know that it's not just you making that assertion. I mean this guy's admitted that he wasn't telling the truth, I believe. Yeah, he admitted it in a in an interview with um, an Icelandic newspaper called the Stunden. Um, and so that's that's evidence that's in part of the uh, the extradition appeal. I, I I wouldn't. There's no you know that something we avoided in this film. We don't make any kind of uh, um, suppositions or or um, any sort of guesswork in in the statements that we make. It's all it's all fact. It's all proven. It's all evidence. It's all um, because there's there's just so much of it. Uh, we don't even need yeah. to go into the sort of uh, yeah. imaginary uh, areas. So uh, just in summary, then, I mean, what can people expect to see in the film then? Uh, Kevin, I know we sort of touched on this as we've been talking. Just kind of just give us a summary, really, of you know, start to finish. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, the main point of difference about this film, um, something that we that I realised when, uh, when I decided to make the film, was that 
Um, there hasn't been a film made that delves into the big why, the, the, the meaning of this situation. Why did this happen? Um, and what can we do about it? And, and the bigger issues and how it affects all of us. How does, it, how does this potentially affect free speech, world peace, our access to information? How do we protect the, the rights of future generations? And how, do, how does this just actually um, affect our, uh, our daily life and, and our futures? Um, and so unlike pretty much every other documentary that's been made uh, on Julian Assange has been uh, what and when, a chronological series of events uh, on this very intricate case. Um, and what we wanted to do was help people to understand it, um, to break it down into uh, just really clear examples and stories and um, uh, just to help people wrap their head around it in, in a couple of hours. Uh, and one of the comments we had at our world premiere from one of the chaps that attended, he said, uh, as the film went on, I got angrier and angrier. Uh, and this film has, and, and that was great to hear because that's one of the goals was that we want people to uh, not only understand it, but feel something and feel motivated to help in some small way. Um, you know, not everyone is going to get out on the street or write a book or make a film or anything like that. But even if people have conversations with their friends or, or, or with their friends or write a letter to their local member of parliament, this, this all uh, adds up to to make a difference um, and that's what we're aiming to do and also the film uh, you can expect to feel something um, we, we were aiming to make a film that uh, reach people through their emotions and we have had uh, success with that with that um, most women and, and even some men cry during this film uh, which is not normal for a documentary but this this story is this situation is so tragic that a an innocent truth teller messenger um, publisher journalist from australia has been persecuted for over 12 years to the brink of death psychologically tortured um, and just ultimately punished in order to ward off other future would-be whistleblowers uh, it's a tragic situation it's it's harrowing it's appalling it's um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a disgusting situation. You, like it, you struggle for words uh, of how yeah. to describe what they've done yeah. to him. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what you will feel through this film. So, um, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's, there's a positive yeah. out, you know, there's, there's positive ideas at the end. Uh, we, we see bits of Julian's humor. We see the real Julian Assange, and that's another thing. We want to humanize someone that's been greatly dehumanized, turned into some sort of villain. Uh, let's look at who the real villains are and, and let's appreciate that this Julian Assange is an idealist, a visionary, an innovator, some would say a genius, and he should be honored and appreciated um, and his innovation should be part of society. They should be what, what informs us uh, on, on what's really going on. Um, so, uh, so we really need to see um, people willing to look into this, uh, to spend the time. Um, so the film has aimed to do that in, a, in, in just a two-hour period that you can fully grasp the weight of this situation, uh, how it's got to this point and a bit of a, an idea of what we need to do um, to solve it. Indeed. Well, it's certainly a wonderful uh, antidote to the uh, appalling negative propaganda that the corporate media and the political class have been spewing out over the last sort of decade or so. How can people view the film then, uh, Kim? Uh, well, it's it's just in the process of uh, sort of starting to be released um, through festivals initially. Uh, so... If you follow our social media, we, we don't have a website yet, but if you follow our socials, you, you can see, you can spot uh, hopefully the upcoming festival um, showing. So we, we're entered, entering various festivals around the world at the moment and, that, and that's already started. So, um, for example, if you live in Poland, you could get to the Warsaw Film Festival coming up next month. Right, uh, right, right. And there'll be other festival screenings. 
Uh, and then as soon as possible, we're, we're talking to distributors at the moment. And as soon as we have that organized, we'll, we'll get it out into cinemas all over the world. Uh, so it, that's where we want it to be seen initially on a big screen yes. where it has the most impact and, Listen. and where you, um, connect with other people and so on in a live yeah. setting. Um, so yeah, just follow our socials and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll have it out as soon as we can. Do you have a, 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 a handle that pe people can um, reach you out there? What what is the what is the social? Uh, what's your website and things like that, for example, that where people can actually plug into the detail of and updates on what's happening? Um, no website yet, but we're on um, Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, Instagram. Um, just basically what's, search what? trustful. Great. Okay. We'll uh, try and get that up on the on the screen then as well. That's uh, that's cool. Thank you. And when we when we uh, uh, share this after it's been broadcast, uh, we'll um, we'll also put those uh, links in any uh, social media posts that we uh, that we that we put out. And uh, just finally, how how can people help? Uh, I mean, I mean, are you sort of still raising funds for for the film and so on, or is there any other way in which people can yeah, help are. watch it? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the, the film has been made possible by the generous support of crowdfunders. We've had over 3,000 support, people support the film, which is fantastic and uh, couldn't have been possible without them. Um, we are still crowdfunding through GoFundMe.com because uh, we have uh, various expenses. We're still doing the post-production sound grading and having the film translated, uh, website and festival entries and, um, yeah, many other expenses they continue uh to incur. So, um, how do we find that? Find how do we find that? Go on. Uh, just on your search engine, just just put in um, the the trust for GoFundMe. It will come up. Oh, great! Thanks, Will. Search that on. Yeah. Well, listen, Kim. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's an incredibly important documentary that you've produced, and all power to your album. I really hope it, it, it gets the success that it that it deserves, and and gets incredibly wide circulation throughout the world. It's crucially important because you know that old cliche: knowledge is power. And I think uh, you know viewing that film, I think as I've already said, will be a huge antidote to the appalling uh, propaganda that we've uh, that we've seen over the last uh, more than a decade against uh, Julian Assange. But Still, there is huge support for him, but we need to grow that support still further. And I think your documentary will be a crucial uh, component in, in helping us to grow the support for Julian. So thanks again for joining us uh, this evening, uh, Kim. And that's all from Resistance TV for this evening. Hopefully we'll be back next week at the same time. So until then, this is Chris Williamson saying bye for now. <laughs>